I think the first ever YouTube video I ever posted was an interview with you. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I think it must have been about I think about 2010. And I think back then we 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 were there weren't many people back then working on like stoicism and CBT. No, there wasn't really a lot going on. I mean, so yeah, it's amazing how much it's changed now. Like it's a huge thing now. Like yeah, there was there wasn't really anything happening back then. There wasn't much at all. There was no stoic meetups. There was no kind of stoic conferences. <laughs> Very little stoic online group or anything uh-huh. like. That. So I mean, obviously, it's it's grown a huge amount in that in that time in in, yeah. in the last um, eight to ten years. Do you yeah. have a sense of how much it's grown? I mean, is that something you can track? Are there metrics for that? I guess for, there's for, a couple of things like we could look at. Um, so we can see the Facebook group. You, you know, I guess it probably started around the same time, and it's got forty six thousand members now the stoicism face group that group that i run and then mm-hmm. i suppose it wasn't long after that that we did the first stoic week and um i think it was small to, one of the first ones i'm not sure if it was the first one or the second one had 700 people mm-hmm. doing stoic week online and the last time we ran it i think it had 8,000. like wow. so like yeah. as an indication of, it just grows slightly bigger every year yeah and uh you know, the funny thing is being in Toronto, I've got a feeling that Toronto might be the city that has the the largest number of people that are interested in stoicism as well. So I feel like I'm kind of in a place where there's a particular buzz around it. Oh, I know one other metric is there's all those local meetup groups. Yeah. Uh, and that a lot of them are connected to the Stoic Fellowship. And they're dotted all over the world. But the one in Toronto has over a thousand members. Uh, believe it or not, yes. yeah, and it's, yeah. Uh, which is by far the largest. So, what the is the, what's the Stoic Fellowship? It's an organisation that encourages people to set up local um, meetup groups and right. discuss Stoicism and stuff. Is that part of modern Stoicism of the modern Stoicism group? No, it's not actually. Like, it's a separate thing. Although it's something that I think we could probably do more to to connect with. There's a bit of there's quite a lot of you know uh, a connection there, a little bit of an overlap. But it's a yeah. separate organisation. And so, why do you think it has grown so much Stoicism in the last decade? Well, uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of reasons. <laughs> so I think, I mean, some of it has got to do that we can take credit for maybe from all the stuff that modern stoicism does. I guess we have to just like, well, Stoic Week and the conferences and the, the Stoicism Today blog, which has over 500 articles in it now. Um, <laughs> so all the stuff that modern stoicism does I've, must have contributed to some extent. Yeah, And also there's just all the books coming out, you know, I mean, is that chicken or egg, you know, are there more books on stoicism because there's a demand for it or is the, mm. the, the demand being fueled by the books coming out? Over the past 10 years, there's sort of been a, a lot of books by different people. And in particular, I think uh, Bill Irving's book and Ryan Holiday's books and also Tim Ferriss has introduced <laughs> a lot of people to stoicism just by, you know, he's... Uh, brought out an audiobook version of Seneca's Letters or something like that, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's yeah. things like that. Yeah. And what, I mean, do you think also that there are kind of cultural reasons as well? Yeah. So the cultural reasons, I believe, and I mean, actually, I'm in the, the, the fortunate position of just being able to kind of echo back stuff that people have said to me. So the things I hear over and over again from people are, you know, first of all, because of the the growth of evidence-based practice and psychotherapy and CBT, that kind of legitimizes a lot of the ancient Stoic ideas. And the, so the growth of popularity in CBT has helped to fuel culturally the, the interest in Stoicism. It's, it's given it more validity. And also a lot of people say they see Stoicism as a kind of Western alternative to Buddhism or other you know Eastern traditions. So they're looking for something that's like Buddhism, but maybe more familiar, more Western. And the other thing is people see it as a kind of secular alternative to Christianity. So it gives them a philosophy of life and an ethic a bit like Christianity, but yeah. rather than being based on faith or revelation or scripture or whatever, they see Stoicism as, as being more based on philosophical reasoning. 
Mm. And people want something that's like academic philosophy, they tell me, but that's more down to earth and more practical. And they see stoicism mm. as, as kind of filling that niche as well. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think it's also, I mean, you look at when stoicism first appeared uh, at a time of political upheaval um, and people shift their idea of the good life, you know, for Plato and Aristotle is very much attached to the, st the kind of the good state. Yeah. And the Stoics and Epicureans, there's this idea, how can we live a good life when, when we can't really trust or know what shape the state will be in? Do you think yeah. that it's that as well? That first of all, it just fits with the individualism of the time. But secondly, there's just a sense of, well, what do I have control over in such a you know a rapidly changing time? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of liberals that say that, that since Trump got elected, they feel they have to fall back on stoicism <laughs> as we're dealing with the, the political situation in the states. You know, that's something people say a lot. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, the, I don't know, like, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, why that's become a thing more recently than, yeah. than it would have been in the past. But mm. I think people do feel that embracing stoicism is a way of coping with a sense of disempowerment mm. um, and the frustration with like the, the political situation uh, mm. around the world. And I suppose the other thing is technology that we, we kind of haven't mentioned there's an odd connection there whereby as we get more immersed in social media and stuff and people feel that that's kind of taking over their lives and, you know, it's affecting the way that we think and interact and relate with other people. People seem to feel that stoicism's em emphasis on simplicity and, you know, self-discipline is a way of compensating for or, or dealing with the negative effects of our immersion in social media. Yeah, that's interesting. That's something I hear a lot as well. And... I mean, as, as an idea or set of ideas takes off, um, no, I mean, no one's really in control of these ideas. You're, you're probably the closest to the Stoic Pope at the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you, even you don't have, a, don't have you know, uh, you can't send out papal bulls or declare fat. No. So particularly with Stoicism, but just with Buddhism as well, or any kind of, any philosophy um, in this, I mean, no one's in charge of them. So has, uh -huh. has it evolved in ways that surprised you over the last decade? Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm really like, surprised, but it's, it's evolved in interesting ways. I, I wouldn't say they came as a big shock, but <laughs> there's, I mean, the thing I think you probably noticed this early on as well, that there's kind of, there are some people that are much more into the religious dimension of stoicism. And one of the interesting things is they've kind of split off, you know, they seem to find <laughs> it hard to integrate with it. And in our data suggests that the majority of people that are interested in stoicism are agnostics or atheists. Oh, yeah. um, which is interesting because, you know, the ancient stoics were, were very religious, you know, particularly Epictetus talks a lot about, about Zeus and the importance of belief in him. But most of the people that embrace Stoicism today aren't very religious. And the ones that are seem to struggle to kind of integrate sometimes with the, the rest of the community. That's a, a <laughs> flashpoint or whatever. And, so what have uh, they and done? Then, have they retreated to, uh, do they call themselves like... Uh, traditional Stoicism is the term that some people use. Is right? that what they call themselves, traditional Stoicism? And is that kind of uh, my old colleague, Eric Weigart from the Stoic Registry, have you come across him? Not, you know yeah, I've seen his stuff. I haven't heard so much from him. Uh, he from and I, we, we, I remember we organized a kind of a very early, tiny gathering of Stoics, yeah. like 2011 or something, where he lives in San Diego. And there was only like 10 people, but there was still managed to be a schism between uh, religious Stoics and then Stoics who hated religion. Yeah, almost kind of refugees from sto from religion. Yeah, that was that was you know there are only ten people there. <laughs> you know? yeah. it, it doesn't entirely surprise me. So there's traditional stoicism, and they kind of ha have their own forums, their own organisations. Yeah. So there's a separate uh, Facebook group, um, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of people that are into religious aspects, theological aspects of stoicism in our mm -hmm. our group as well. But there does seem to be like a little bit of friction there sometimes. And then right, the yeah. other one is people talk about like broicism is the term that, that people use to describe 
Um, or so people talk about Silicon Valley stoicism as well. So they, there's a lot of people in the tech industry that get into stoicism, and, and sometimes uh, people feel that it's kind of like life coaching and personal development and self improvement stuff, but it it kind of lacks the emphasis on uh, simplicity and austerity and stuff like that that you get in right. in ancient stoicism. So like mm. there's there's a bit of a divergence there, I guess. Some stoic, yeah. some stoicism is a bit more materialistic, but you can even see that. In the, I mean, Seneca was one of the wealthiest men in history. Yeah, right? and then yeah, Epictetus yeah, yeah. is a it was a freed slave that sounds like he lived in poverty. Um, right. So even in the in the ancient world, it sounds like there was a bit of a split between Stoics who kind of renounced wealth and and other ones that accumulated a lot of wealth but said that they weren't attached to it. So do you think there are people a bit like? people using mindfulness without really being committed to a Buddhist ethics. There will be, there are people using stoic techniques, um, you know, as a kind of life hack, as, as, as a way to pursue conventional goals rather than radically different ethical goals. That's exactly. Yeah. And that's the phrase. Sometimes people describe stoicism as a life hack because that's a popular phrase these days, but that Mm -hmm. kind of ruffles, some of the communities feathers because they they think well stoicism isn't a life hack it's a a philosophy of life um mm. it's an ethic and a worldview like it would be like calling christianity a life hack or something you know <laughs> maybe in some sense you could be but it seems odd to describe it yeah. uh, to frame it that way it's like you're just kind of like taking a bit of it and not really embracing and, the thing and so. why not just use cbt in that case because that is still yeah. about the ethics i guess yeah yeah i guess if you take a, a lot of the stuff out of your life is something that, that it's closer to CBT or, or yeah. CBT based self help. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it is, um, it, the, the data does seem to suggest that modern stoicism is more popular with, um, uh, with men than women. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, but I, I've got a way of disputing that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Because you're right. I think it's like roughly two thirds of the people that participate yeah. in the group and do Stoic Week Online tend to be men although i think in one instance one of the times we ran stoic week it was closer to 50 50 for some reason but generally it's it's about two-thirds men but uh there's a like predominantly men are uh study philosophy at university yeah if i remember right i looked at some statistics on that a while ago and so there's a similar kind of gender disparity among philosophy students in general and also in the epicurean group I asked them about this once and they told me they had a similar gender split. Yeah. So I wonder if it is really reflective of stoicism per se, or if it's simply a reflection of a, a broader gender disparity in studying classical philosophy. Well, yeah, I, I, I certainly in churches, churches are more uh, women than men on the whole. Um, and I, I'd be interested to know in Western Buddhism, whether it's more women than men. Certainly when I go to, well, never mind yoga. Yoga is way more women than men. But mm. Buddhism, when I go to a Buddhist retreat, usually it's more women than men. Right. And it's certainly in psychology, like A level and at university, it's more women than men. Mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, is that a problem to your mind, or is that a good thing? Insofar as this is a way to to get techniques and ideas for emotional health to uh, men who uh, you know would probably be turned off by psychotherapy or so on i mean it, it, is, is that is it an issue for you well that's the thing i mean it is true there's a couple of points that i mean from, from what you've just said i mean one is that stoicism does provide a way of getting therapy techniques to men that would be turned off by the whole concept of counseling or therapy that's mm. that's certainly the case um is it a problem that there's a gender disparity well i don't know like, there's a part of me thinks well it's just the way that it is and Mm-hmm. There's another part of me that thinks if I think if there was more input from women in the community, it might help to kind of make it, the, some of the discussions more balanced. I definitely have a sense that there is this emphasis on love and compassion and you know mm-hmm. these kind of qualities in classical stoicism that gets neglected often, like in the broicism type stuff. It's the, there's not much mention of that. Whereas if you look at the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, I've, I often point this out to people. If you just flick through it on virtually every page, he talks about uh, love, compassion, the brotherhood of man, you know, not being alienated from the rest of mankind, 
um, in social virtues and stuff. And this whole social and relationship dimension of stoicism is often neglected in, in modern accounts, like completely absent mm -hmm. from some of the books in the subject. And mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of feel that if women engaged more, then they might, you know, bring out some of that dimension uh, mm -hmm. of it a little bit more. And, mm -hmm. uh, or if it's predominantly men, for, for some reason, they, I feel that they're more inclined to neglect that side. So, um, obviously, Stoicism flourished online. Um, and, you, and you run one of the, the biggest uh, Facebook group. And they're also like, I guess, what there's a Reddit page. There's a lot of blogs yeah. now, YouTube videos, podcasts, yeah. e books. Um, <laughs> so, what, what, and how, what, I mean, what's your sense of those online Stoic communities? And what are they like as, as cultures? Um, I, I went on the other day to promote one of my talks and I got, I got, I don't know, I got ticked off for having criticised Stoicism in one of my talks. So, but that was the first time I'd been on there for a while. What are they like as places? Are they places um, that, um, where people support each other or they're kind of disclosing stuff? Or is it are they places more where people go for like intellectual discussion or... How would you characterize like, your, your Facebook group, for example? Well, the first thing I'd say is like, um, I, have a, I have a very different perspective on it. There's a reason mm -hmm. why I perceive it differently from many of the people that, that go into the group. And it has to do with the way Facebook works, right? So there are between 500 to 1,000 posts in my group every month. So there's a lot of content there. Mm. And sometimes I'll get people who go on and say, this group is just full of people arguing about veganism. Or they'll say, this group is just dominated by liberals. Or this group is dominated by the alt-right. Or this group is dominated by people that are just into academic stuff. But I think, I've, there's a thousand posts a month. Like, mm. And there's a, the, it, it's very diverse. So there are people just sharing their own personal struggles and discussing mm. those. There are people arguing fine technical points in, in mm. classical philosophy. And, you know, there are people from all ends of the political spectrum debating it. But people viewing it will only see a tiny percentage of the total number of posts normally. Yeah. And I, I think it's the ones that they react to and comment on, they're probably more likely to see more similar posts or posts from the same author or so on. Oh, so they, nice. they get a kind of, you can see that they get a very biased perception and they assume that that's representative of the whole group mm. usually and i have to kind of point out to them no those are that's just the bits that you're interacting with you know right, 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 like right. you know you think it's all uh, dominated by theology or dominated by uh, libertarians or whatever but it just so happens that that's one percent of the content that you're okay. engaging with right, right showing you more of it so my perspective is moderator i see a much broader spectrum and it, what i see is a, is a very diverse range of interests among the, the people that are in the group and you also um do a stoic course online um do you do yeah just during stoic week or do you do that all the time um i run i have a course on marcus aurelius that i run like maybe three times a year two or three times a year and also have a course about socrates that's uh, that runs a couple of times a year and um, and do you still? I mean, when when I was working in modern stoicism, you would just give this away for free. Uh, I, I are you still doing that, or I hope you're charging? No, we char I charge for the courses that I run on my own website, and then we have <laughs> Stoic Week is free, and also we have a bigger course that modern stoicism runs called the Stoic Mindfulness and Resilience Training. That's a yeah. four week skills based training that's also free, and we use that to gather. It's a like a slightly more controlled experiment, as it were, and we use that to uh, gather data on the, the benefits of, of using stoicism, psychological benefits. Right, right, right. And do you get uh, a good... So the modern stoicism courses are free, and then my own courses are charged for. And do you get a good sign-up for the ones you're charging for? Do I get a good... Uh, do, you Sorry, good, uh, good, do, you, uh, do you get a good sign up for them? Uh, have, have they proven to be popular? The courses that you're um, the paid paid used courses. Yeah, they've been pretty popular so far, especially when I first launched them. There was I was surprised. I think 
Uh, the number of people that enrolled in the Marcus Aurelius course the first time I ran it was about four times what I anticipated. Mm -hmm. So they obviously the numbers are smaller for paid courses, but like uh, you know, I, I was pretty impressed by the number of people that signed up for it. And I, each time I rerun the courses, I get you know more people enroll and do them. So that's becoming a, a thing, an ongoing and thing. Do you, I mean, have we seen? Have you seen the appearance of, or are you? Would you do you want to invo uh, yourself uh, develop? like new stoic tech like uh, I, I haven't really seen yet a kind of stoic headspace for example there was talk of this kind of was it called pocket stoicism or something but it didn't really happen yeah have you do you yeah. see that or is that something you you want to work on i've seen people developing i mean i've talked to people about apps being developed and there, there are a bunch of apps that are out there um you know i've not been so involved with that um but i i mean there are there are already a couple of apps available, and I, I think that there are bound to be more that develop over time. Mm. Um, but it's not an area that I've been doing a lot of work in. I've kind of collaborated a little bit with app developers, but but not so much. I tend to stick with the like the blog and the uh, yeah. the like the web based uh, e learning and stuff side. But what I have been developing recently is um, in terms of the content e-learning courses that are more focused on specific applications. So before it was more so recently I thought, well, I'll try a specific application. So I designed a short e-learning course um, about coping with chronic pain using stoicism. Oh, and I, yeah. I put that together. I created an audio recording that people could listen to that would train them in psychological skills based on stoicism and um, we put that up. I think about 400 people did the beta version and I gathered a lot of feedback from them and it was it was very positive. The satisfaction ratings were like 88 to 95% for different mm. aspects of the, yeah. the thing. So overall, they seem to say this is viable. Yeah. You know, we haven't tested how, if it, we haven't done proper controlled experiments on it, but the initial beta test was just to go, is this viable? Like, do you guys see yourselves doing this like do you think yeah. there's anything we need to prove about it and the mm. the initial feedback was oh no it's fine yeah this is usable like right? mm. it seems to be it seems to have potential so the next step would be then to do a kind of clinical trial based on that mm. and do you think there are other um particular kinds of issues or or disorders that stoicism might be particularly useful for yeah um i mean i just wrote an article i co-authored it with one of the editors of the behavior therapist um, which goes out to all, all the cognitive behavioral therapists in, in the States. And we, we wrote an article kind of talking about the relationship between stoicism and CBT. You know, I mean, although this is something I talk about a lot and uh, I've written about a lot, I tend to do it in a more kind of popular self-help way. So, yeah. you know, this time I thought, no, I want to properly address professional psychotherapists mm. and talk about it in a slightly, from a slightly more technical and academic point of view so we put mm -hmm. this article together and went out in one of the journals and the conclusion that i argued for at the end of it was that stoicism has particular potential and non-psychotherapists tend not to to think of this but uh, i i argued that the real value of stoicism is as a preventative training approach so what we tend to call emotional resilience building in the, yeah. in the psychology field so the prevention is better than cure right and mm. prevention of anxiety and depression be the holy grail of psychotherapy so mm. cbt is normally designed to treat is remedial it's therapeutic it treats problems that have already developed whereas stoicism yeah. i think ha, has more potential as a preventative training approach yeah i agree um they, i mean in the uk there's been a lot of talk about putting more money into preventative mental health but, um, and like what's called Public Health England have talked about that. But, and you know, you could definitely do courses in ancient Greek philosophy in kind of community groups and charities and so forth. I mean, I've done some of them. But um, I think, yeah, there's still a bit of a lack of an evidence base for things like practical philosophy and, uh, you know. Um, but, I, but it's, I, I guess it's, you know, hopefully there'll be more trials of this kind of stuff. We're getting closer. I mean, we're kind of inching closer. We've got some psychologists um, involved 
from America uh, that are working with Tim LeBon on, I mean, Tim's gathered huge volumes of data. But, mm. You know, it's kind of pilot studies, like we're doing like correlational studies, you know, we've got a self-selecting sample. So we need to do yeah. more rigorously controlled studies. Mm. But we, with SMRT, with the, the, the slightly more like rigorous training we had, one of the things yeah. we did last time around was a three month follow-up to see, you know, just as a, an initial pilot level to see whether the results were sticky. And that's get edging closer to, you know, looking at the longer term benefits as a preventative mm. approach. And what Tim found was really surprising because normally you'd see a reduction in the improvements that people report at three months, that would be natural. So you want to, you're hoping to minimize the, the, the amount that those improvements are reduced by. And he saw virtually no change. Mm. So three months later, people were reporting the same level of improvement that they'd experienced immediately after the, the four week training. Mm. And that's very promising. Um, you know, it'd be interesting then to see at six months, and at one year follow up, is it still sticky? And what yeah. happens? if we have a random uh, sample of people that aren't self-selecting, you know, would they get the same benefit from it? And what happens if we then compare it against positive psychology based or CBT based resilience training? So yeah. those would be the next steps. I think we're, we're pretty, we're getting closer to doing that though. Mm. I also feel excited about the potential for stoicism in prisons. Because yeah. You just, you just, I mean, they're just about, six or seven or maybe even like 10 people working independently around the world yeah. and they've all either consciously or or just by accident come across the fact that stoicism really resonates with people in inmates uh, particularly male inmates yeah um and i i just think there's there's this huge potential even just to put together like a kind of little book or pamphlet that's like very, very basic stoic ideas with some of the kind of role models of people who practice this in 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 prisons yeah um, yeah and there's the book there's that book the epictetus club by a, a guy who works in prisons yeah the, the other kind of niche that there's the, i mean we talked about the culture and stuff it might be worth saying mm. i've noticed over the years that are, that are these kind of subgenres or niches of of different professional groups or types of people that get into stoicism yeah so there's the people working in prisons that get into it and inmates that get into it. And mm. then there's the military as well. There's a bunch of, of people that just independently around the world involved in the military. And again, yeah. there's that book by Nancy Sherman about stoicism in the military. So that's yeah. like a little thing in its own as well. And then there's also sports coaches that get yeah. into stoicism as well as the psychotherapists that are into it and the classicists and the philosophers that are into it. And then yeah. there's the kind of trainers and life coaches and the kind of like, uh, the people that work in the tech industry, sort of niche. So within stoicism, there's these kind of sub communities. There are, and comedians. Comedians that are into stoicism as well, yeah. yeah. Aging comedians, right. aging comedians. <laughs> After the laughter stops, they turn to stoicism. Yeah. I, I, I know of quite a few comedians who, who like older comedians, who've got into stoicism, like Adrian Evans, right. oh, right. yeah, yeah. Sale, John Lloyd. Uh huh. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah, and I guess performers in a way, because you have performance anxiety. So I think sometimes, yeah, know, performers of different type, whether that's sports or, or theatre or, or music, can use stoicism to manage some of that performance anxiety. Yeah, the Stoics talk about performance anxiety. Actually, Epictetus has got a discourse about it, and yeah. uh, also, I mean, people talk about. He's got a discourse about playing ball, doesn't he? How yeah, do yeah, yeah. Pretty. They talk a bit about sports and stuff, about playing ball. And also comedy. Um, there were Stoic satirists, uh, Perseus, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the cynics were also known for, for writing satires. And right. uh, Chris Ipus apparently wrote a lot of jokes. And even according to one story, Chris Ipus, the, uh, the third head of the Stoa, um, mm. and, and one of the most important Stoics mm. uh, in a way, yeah. uh, supposedly died... Uh, um, from uh, laughing at one of his own jokes. <laughs> 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 like that Monty Python sketch where they have the joke that's so funny that it, like, right, it's dangerous. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know that one? Like, so, laughed, one uh, of his own jokes killed him. <laughs> <laughs> so, did, he get, did he ever get to tell anyone else the joke? Or he, Yeah, but it's, I don't, it, it's kind of, you know, like, uh, it's some sort of pun or something. I don't know. It's they lost really in translation. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you get um do you get approached by people um saying 
would you be my stoic mentor or my, you know, would you, would you, would you give me or my organization stoic coaching? Um, yeah. Yeah, sometimes, but I haven't been doing a lot of that. Like it's not, I, I kind of didn't have the time to do it. So I've been a bit busy recently yeah. doing everything else under the sun. Right. Um, kind of writing and, and doing e-learning and stuff. I've done a little bit of individual like stoic life coaching and stuff. Right. Um, and uh, not so much with organizations, more with individuals. Like, uh, yeah. But, uh, uh, most of what I've been doing has been writing and designing e-learning courses and running those recently. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and have you come across any celebrity Stoics? Celebrity Stoics? Like, there are a few, aren't there? Like, um, yeah, I'm not really up to, super up to speed on that. But uh, no, you've, had, you've had no kind of limousines pulling up in front of your house. and uh... <laughs> Oh, people that want to. <laughs> it's like famous Stoics. Like, I was talking recently to those... Um, Karen Duffy uh, in the States used to be a, an MTV presenter and she was in some movies and right. she's in Dumb and Dumber and uh, she was like a, a Revlon model and stuff. And she wrote a book about coping with chronic pain uh, called Backbone, how to live with living with chronic pain without becoming one. I think it's a subtitle and it's got a lot of stuff in it about stoicism. Hmm. Uh, so she's kind of on TV and stuff and uh, she's been in movies and things and she's into stoicism. And then like you say in Britain, there seem to be a bunch of people, oh, Darren Brown's into stoicism. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, like, there's like, <laughs> a bunch of other people on TV that get into it. He wrote about stoicism in his book, Happy. Have you read that book? Not yet. But, it's really good, actually. I've all, I've read a it? lot of books recently. I had to review loads of these books. Um, yeah. That's probably my favourite out of all the books I've read over the past year. Okay, or so. so so you've warmed to Darren Brown, have you? Yeah, I, I mean, I really, like, I enjoyed that book. I wasn't super into all the kind of, like, I, I said in my review, and you know, like, I've, uh, I think I've said to him, like, I, I, can't, I hate magic. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and illusionists and stuff, like, it's like, for all sorts of reasons that, I don't have any truck with it, but I, I read his book and he's actually a surprisingly good writer. Yeah. Um, and I say that because I've read so many self-help books today and, and like recently and, um, you know, the quality of writing and the, the, the thoughtfulness in his mm. book was a level like beyond. Uh, he's he's pretty, he's there. pretty, he's pretty erudite, isn't he? I mean, he's kind of a... He is very erudite, yeah. 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 And the, the, so there's a chunk of it stoicism in there that was kind of interesting. Mm. And then uh, I'd read also recently, I read Nassim Taleb's book anti fragile which has mm. a chapter on stoicism and and like but you know that was just terrible and like really unreflective and had loads of mistakes in it and like it was and he seems not pretty, good at all like, yeah, he's and he seems pretty uh pretty pompous for someone talking about anti-fragility he seems to have a very inflated fragile eagle yeah <laughs> like, is that, yeah, is that like harsh what? yeah that's just how it comes across but i don't know I think that a lot of people say that right he's always yeah. arguing with people on twitter serious right? serious big head yeah yeah, but the the chapter he wrote on stoicism has a bunch of mistakes in it. Like, like just it's odd. He says something in that book about how he doesn't like using copy editors or proofreaders, and so he doesn't actually say whether he, his manuscript was edited or whatever. But it kind of looks like it wasn't because mm. the I would have thought an editor would have spotted some of the things that he like historical inaccuracies and right. Uh, like he talks about. Seneca's Fortune, which he quotes from Cassius Dio, but he gets the denomination wrong. Like it's just like like a like a almost like a typo or something, and other like weird little inaccuracies. Why, did, like, why didn't you tell him on Twitter? I did. Um, I reviewed it, and I, like I, I, he said, he read my review, uh, but right. he, he was very happy about it. I think he like, you know, probably called me an idiot or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like he does with everybody, he gets attracted to that. Like, I said, he said that Seneca is a child of the Italian peninsula, he says. And I was like, He's Seneca was Spain. born in Spain. Yeah. Like, everyone knows that Seneca was born in Spain, <laughs> right? And uh, I said that to him, and he said something kind of cryptic about, oh, that's not what he meant. But I was like, what did you mean? Like, in what sense is he a child of the Italian peninsula? <laughs> like, but yeah, anyway, so I, don't, I wasn't super impressed with that account of stoicism. But, okay. Uh, Darren Brown's this, book was much more good. reflective. Yeah, that's good. Um, do you um, do you think that modern Stoicism and the revival of Stoicism has influenced, um, you know, academia uh, much, uh, academic philosophy, um, 
classicism or just general like you know the idea of what the point of a university is and what what university education can do do you see that I'm not sure how much, if I could kind of quantify that, but definitely, I mean, yeah. I see a little bit that we have these academics that come to the conference and stuff, right? Mm. And uh, like, you know... So they come they, initially scornful and then kind of warm up to it. <laughs> I think so. Or some of them seem quite just taken aback. Um, you Because they're like, used to speaking to like, you know, eight people in a lunchtime. Yeah, exa- right, exactly, right? Yeah. So I think some of them are like, well, yeah, we, we're used to speaking to smaller groups of people, not like 400, we had 400 people at the Toronto conference. And so yeah. them, I think some of them were just like, well, there's, there's this many people that are interested in stoicism. Mm. And we're like, no, like there's loads more, or like it's a huge thing. They're not really exposed to the yeah. that audience. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a little bit of a, a surprise for them in a way that there's that level of interest. Mm. And, uh, you know, maybe they're a little bit scornful at first, but generally, you know, once they come along to the conference and stuff and they see there's other academic speaking and things that, yeah. you know, they warm up to it. Yeah. And I wonder if I just, you know, I mean, I, I, I do, uh, I, I've started to do a course for undergraduates on a, a kind of interdisciplinary course at my university on like well being, And that includes like a lecture on stoicism and CBT. And just to bring in some of that kind of practical wisdom into, you know, into universities, um, which I think American universities, you know, they, they may be a bit better at doing than British ones. You know, they sometimes have these introductory courses and they might include right, some great yes. books in that. You know, like um, Jonathan Haidt did his course on flourishing and maybe had a bit on the Stoics and so yeah. on. So that's something maybe, I, I would love right. to see. Yeah, you know, yeah. just like really basic, basic stuff that can be very useful for any whatever you're majoring in. Uh, yeah, yeah. And traditionally, stoicism isn't really taught at all in most undergraduate uh, philosophy uh, curricula. No. Um, you know, I didn't study the Stoics when I uh, studied philosophy uh, at Aberdeen. It wasn't until I finished my my philosophy degree that I, I came across them. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's odd. But you know, I think maybe that's beginning. I think that's changing, but it's changing very slowly. Yeah. And, I mean, the other thing that I find odd as well, I should say, is, you know, we sort of forget about this sometimes. So there's this big connection between stoicism and CBT. And, and like everybody seems to be aware of that now that's into the stoicism. It's generally understood. But still, you know, even a decade or, or, or more, like I've been giving talks on stoicism and writing articles about it for like at least 15 years but maybe a bit more than that now but um like the psychotherapists still haven't really kind of like latched onto it you know like there there's not a kind of stoicism movement within psychotherapy or cbt which kind of surprises me you know i think because there is a buddhist movement isn't there yeah yeah like but they haven't and so like you say independently a lot of psychotherapists discover stoicism but they haven't kind of collectively started to to embrace it and so i was trying to actually give that a nudge by publishing that article on the behavior therapist to mm. see if i could prompt them a little bit more to to realize there was it was worth engaging with at a, a different yeah. level yeah a deeper yeah. level um so yeah that surprises me a little bit i kind of i kind of thought the cbt practitioners would have jumped on it a little bit more because mm. everyone else all the clients seem to see the connection yeah uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you, tell me about your the new book. So, uh, it's called um, what's the full title? It's called How to Think Like an Emperor. How to Think Like a Roman Emperor: okay. The Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. Right. right. So the title, the main title, was a little bit cryptic, but I was trying to clarify in the subtitle that we're not talking about Caligula <laughs> or Nero. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about the Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. And, uh, yeah, I mean, so I was asked to write a book about, or it was suggested that I write a book, another book about Stoicism. And I thought, well, I've already written a couple of books about Stoicism. And I, I wrote a Teach Yourself book, Stoicism and the Art of Happiness. It's like a basic self-help introduction. And it's just gone into its second revised edition, actually. And I'm about to also do a revised edition of my first book in Stoicism, The Philosophy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. So that, mm-hmm. both those books have been popular enough that they're, they're being published in uh, in second editions, like uh, with a lot of revisions. Uh, but they, so it was, it was suggested I write another book about Stoicism, and I thought, well, I can't do another beginner's guide to Stoicism because I've done that already. And also, there are loads of those now, like a bunch of other people have written kind of introductions and beginner's guides to, to Stoicism. So I thought, well, 
I want to write something that's going to be accessible to a wider audience, but I don't want to just kind of, you know, reinvent the wheel. And I thought about it and, uh, you know, how could I approach it from a different perspective? And the, the thing that, that really inspired me was uh, I have a, a seven-year-old daughter called Poppy and she loves Greek mythology. So I told her lots of stories about Greek mythology. And when I ran out of stories about Greek mythology, I started to tell her stories about Greek philosophy. So she really loves stories about Socrates and Diogenes and Sinek and stuff. And uh, I, I realized that, you know, in the ancient world, philosophy was taught not just through dialogues and lectures, but through lots of little anecdotes and stories. And, and some of them come from satires, like I mentioned earlier. So we have a collection of those in Diogenes Laertius, uh, The Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers. Is a, yeah. We have an entire book that's, that's full of all these little like, anecdotes and, and stories about philosophers and their lives. And many of them kind of communicate important philosophical points, practical wisdom and stuff. And as I was telling Poppy these little stories and getting her to think about life and stuff, you know, through these anecdotes, I thought that this is another way of teaching philosophy. And in many ways, it's a better, it's a more accessible way of teaching uh, philosophy. There's a longer tradition, but there's not, there's not much literature like that about classical philosophy today. Um, and so I thought, well, also the Stoics seem to me to have thought that learning from role models and learning by looking at examples of, of real people is a better way to learn Stoicism than, than just through lectures. They seem pretty clear about that, and they, they talk about it in various places. Um, and you see in Epictetus, he's often taught, referring to Diogenes and Socrates as role models, and, and also people that he knew personally. There's a guy called uh, Paconius Agrippinus, um, who was a, a member of the Stoic opposition that Epictetus mm. talks about as this kind of role model and what we can learn from him. So mm -hmm. I thought maybe I can write a, a beginner's guide to Stoicism that approaches it in terms of telling these stories about historical figures that were Stoics. And I thought, well, the Stoic that we know most about is the last famous Stoic. Yeah. Uh, and actually, after Marcus Aurelius, we hear virtually nothing about any any other Stoics, strangely. I mean, but, unless you count Boethius as a Stoic, I guess. Unless you count, well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I'd count him as a, as a Stoic, but Stoic influence, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, but the Marcus Aurelius, um, you know, we know quite a lot about. Um, and in fact, people that are into the meditations usually don't realize how much we know about his life because mm. we have several Roman histories that describe his character and his reign and contain you know, a bunch of anecdotes about him that often have some philosophical significance. And so I, I thought, well, we can write about Marcus Aurelius. And he's the most popular Stoic. More people have read the meditations than have read Seneca or Epictetus. Mm. And, you know, I thought, well, let's write about his life. And, you know, I'll try and make it so that each chapter of the book tells a story about his life and then links it to the philosophy. And then I'll link that to cognitive behavioral therapy or, you know, modern psychological sure. self-help approaches that people can actually apply. And each chapter deals with a different issue, like coping with anger, managing unruly desires and overcoming bad habits, coping with pain and illness, dealing, dealing with, with anger. Dealing with barbarians. Dealing with down barbarian <laughs> uprising. Yeah. Goths. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a chapter about that. Like, there's a lot of stuff with the plague. Like, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that comes with the plague. Yeah. <laughs> so, what what were some of the kind of episodes from his life which you think show that he was a wise person as well as a, a good writer? There's a bunch of uh, interesting things. Um, there's an anecdote about uh, the civil war. Like, right? they so there was a civil war during his reign. And there was uh, the most powerful general uh, in the Roman army was a guy called Avidius Cassius. And he was stationed in the east while Marcus was fighting a, a protracted war at the other side uh, of the empire and the, and the northern frontier. And uh, Avidius Cassius became more and more powerful until eventually he was kind of vying with Marcus Aurelius. And he had himself declared emperor. Um, so, for, he, so this kind of instigated the civil war. We don't really know much about, even if there were many actual battles, there must have been some, but we don't hear a lot about them. But it didn't last very long anyway. So Cassius was much more hawkish than Marcus. Marcus had a, a, a took, he, I think he was frustrated that the, the, the war on the northern frontier was taking so long. But that was partly because Marcus was trying to negotiate a lot between the 
various tribes and there was a lot of complicated political negotiations that had to take place and Marcus was more of a dove he was thinking more about the long-term welfare of the empire whereas Cassius I think just wanted to go up there and kill everybody and get it over with but mm. uh, so there was a civil war and there's a speech that Cassius Dio reports Marcus giving and it, it, it's kind of amazing um, it, we don't know for sure how authentic this speech is but if there's any grain of truth in it like what Marcus does uh, is that he announces that he's going to pardon everybody that's involved in this which is a really striking thing to do. And again, we can see that as, you know, the Stoics were against revenge. Like, in, in the meditations, he talks a lot about forgiveness and understanding even your enemies. Yeah. And so in this speech, he seems to be acting in that way. And he says, I'm going to pardon everybody that's involved in this. Mm. And I assume that it's based on some kind of misunderstanding. Yeah. Now, ironically, that ended the war because Marcus actually had a superior army to Avidius Cassius. His rebellion didn't spread to the other provinces because they remained loyal to Marcus. And where Cassius kind of used brutality and force to discipline his troops, Marcus was more benevolent and, and earned the trust and loyalty of his troops mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. So they, the people, other uh, eastern provinces remained loyal to Marcus, even though he was far away. But uh, ironically, Cassius's men thought, well, there's a good chance we're all going to die in this war. Like, Marcus has got a stronger army, um, and, and we're going to get pardoned anyway, right? Like, so he, two of his off officers assassinated him. They chopped his head off. and uh, Assassinated uh, Avidius. Avidius Cassius. Like, uh, you know, three months into the, the rebellion, they were yeah. like, there's no point fighting this. We're all going to get pardoned anyway. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and so Marcus was as good as his word, and he for, forgave of everybody um and that was the end of it like mm -hmm. and he actually the story goes that not only did he do that but he actually protected cassius's wife and children from persecution right. following yeah. the war but then after marcus died commodus who wasn't a stoic had them hunted down and burned alive as traitors so it's so it's so it's it's not just a hollywood myth that commodus you know was was not uh was not a very philosophical that the, the Marcus Aurelius's son Commodus was was a bit of a a wrong one. Yeah, he he wasn't. The, there's different accounts of. I mean, according to one of the. I mean, we we also have to take these histories with a little bit of a pinch of salt. So it's hard mm. to say how reliable they are. But according to one, and they and they seem very ne very negative about Commodus. Like it's, mm -hmm. it seems like exaggeration maybe. But he, according to one account anyway, he he was more just gullible. And easily swayed and he was kind of manipulated by the circle of people that surrounded him right mm. but he shortly after marcus died he abandoned the northern frontier they paid big bribes to the barbarian kings in order to settle and then mm. he, he was desperate to return to rome and it was partly because he wanted to avoid the plague perhaps which was uh, more of a risk in the legionary camps because when people were camped close together that the, the, there were more uh, more risk of catching and contracting the plague or other illnesses. So, uh, so he went back to Rome. But mm -hmm. that meant that he no longer really, you know, a, a Roman emperor has to maintain his status by getting the support of the Senate, the support of the army, and Commodus kind of blew that. So the other way that you maintain your status as emperor is getting the support of the populace at Rome. And the way you do that is by throwing lots of events and festivals and you know so becoming... he really so like the film he really was fond of kind of uh gladiatorial yeah. contest oh yeah yeah and he turned himself actually ironically you know uh, kind of relevant today in a way he he, he became more like a celebrity so mm. he, he you could say he's trying to develop it and he, you know, there's all these statues of him dressed in a lion headdress like hercules mm. So he's trying mm. to kind of deify himself, mythologize himself, mm. turn himself into this celebrity in order yep. to maintain his status because he'd blown his reputation with the army. Interesting. So I guess the one the thing that interests, one of the things that surprised me about Marcus Aurelius is there he is, may, may, maybe the most powerful man in the world um, and uh, a, a great Stoic philosopher. And I guess he's, he was in a position where he could have tried to kind of spread Stoicism to the masses in the way that the Emperor Julian tries to spread yeah. you know, Platonism. Uh, uh, but he doesn't, does he? Can he? Marcus says something like, there's a, some, some quote which you all know better than me about, uh, you know, the, you, you can't force Stoicism onto people. All you get is 
grudging, grudging or feigned assent. That you know that you can't really impose philosophy on on the masses from above. But I mean, this is kind of like the stoic idea that we need to lead by example, though, rather than lecturing right. people. Right. Um, okay. So I mean, so did am I right in thinking that he didn't really try to kind of promote stoicism to the empire? He was never a philosopher king, like a kind of platonic figure. I think this is ambiguous, actually. It's kind of hard to, to tell. Like, mm -hmm. probably not. But uh, the Historia Augusta says that he read uh, from a, a book of philosophical uh, aphorisms that he'd written uh, at Rome. So right. it's not clear if that's the meditations or somehow related to it, or if it's another text. He would read this out. Can... Yeah, he, he, he gave some kind of public reading from his, uh, from his philosophical writings, mm. it, it alleges. Um, right. And then there's also a number of other accounts about how there were lots of philosophers attracted to Rome at that time and several eminent teachers. So like a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon, as it were, because they all knew that he was at the, there's certainly there's no question that everybody knew that Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic. And so Stoicism yeah. did kind of become trendy at yeah, the time, yeah. like during yeah. his reign. Um, and there were other powerful Stoics uh, that were part of his uh, like the, the ruling classes at that time as well. But we don't know that much more about it. It doesn't seem like, he, yeah, he made a real uh, effort to directly uh, convert people, but he was also kind of busy fighting wars and stuff. Like he, didn't, <laughs> was probably, he didn't have that much time to go about doing that. But, but, but there if, were a lot of Stoic philosophers around at the time. And what do you think is, uh, is one of his most useful practical ideas for us today there are it's, yeah. like there are so many actually the, the first book that i wrote i went back and looked at it recently like the the different stoic psychological strategies that I, i'd identified when i was kind of reviewing them and there were to see how many there were and there were about 18 sort of depending on how you carve it up mm -hmm. so there are a whole bunch of things that we can potentially learn from marcus but i think one of the most useful things is the the view from above like mm -hmm. and, you know this idea of viewing things within a, a broader context um and you know, which is of, what for someone who hasn't heard of that give, give me a brief kind of description of that practice well I, i'll tell you something really cool about it so there's there are several passages in marcus where he says uh, he, he attributes this to Plato actually he says mm. Plato says we should survey events as if viewing them from some high watchtower and mm. he talks about viewing like people in law courts and uh, traders and fighting battles and picturing all the events in the world from from high above and we have a number of very similar accounts of this kind of perspective or psychological exercise in yeah. other philosophical traditions as well not just in the Stoics um, you know, like Cicero, for example, there's a, a, a famous passage called the Dream of Scipio, like, where a Roman general's portrayed you know, a, having a dream where he views uh, Carthage uh, and Rome fighting each other from really high above to mm. get a kind of detached perspective and look at the bigger picture. But I'll tell you something interesting I noticed when I went to Athens recently, it struck me, um, you know, this should be obvious, but it wasn't until I actually went there the you know, in the middle of Athens, there's the Acropolis, which literally just means high up part of the city. So yeah. there, there's a hill in the middle of the city with uh, that had temples and stuff on it. And uh, so all the Athenians would be familiar with that. Um, and when you go up there, you, you, you're looking down on Athens. And in particular, you, you have a, a view of the Agora, where the assemb political assemblies took place and mm. people traded and there were shops and market stalls and stuff. So all this stuff that Marcus Aurelius describes there like is pretty much what you'd see looking down from the temples and stuff on the acropolis yeah and i, I wonder if the, the the greek philosophers that were were kind of influenced by that they must have been familiar with looking down on the, the agora like that and that's interesting there's in in the in the clouds by aristophanes you have yeah that's right up in the cloud don't you when he when he comes on stage and, and i wonder do you think what is your thought on the idea the fact that um, philosophers like Marcus um, were all, all initiated at the uh, at the mysteries. So Marcus was initiated into the mysteries of uh, the of Eleusis and also right. well known uh, the the myth the Mithraic Mithraic. mysteries. Do you, I mean it's hard to tell, isn't it? How that might have first of all what happened at these mysteries and how it influenced you know yeah. philosophy. Um, we know that Cicero said the Eleusinian mysteries are the, are the greatest gift of Greek civilization. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that something pretty powerful went on. And there, you know, there is the theory. I, I personally am open to it. I guess I'm even sympathetic to it, that this was some kind of psychedelic uh, initiation that they went through. And maybe this influence, there is one book I read which suggested this influenced the Stoic idea of the interconnectedness of all things, that rather mystical vision of the loss, of, yeah. uh, of the universe being one breathing animate web, which, which Marcus describes so beautifully. Uh, do you have a theory? I mean, what's your thought? I suppose it's just hard to know, isn't it? Well, were, that's the problem is that they were secretive, so we know very little yeah. about them. But uh, I mean, and we don't know for sure that Marcus was initiated into Mithraism, but I, I wrote an article about this where I argued, I think he probably was, because yeah. Antoninus Pius, his adopted father, the emperor that preceded him, and also Commodus, his son, uh, both seem to have been initiated into the, the cult of Mithras. So right. it seems very likely that Marcus would have been as well, because mm. where he stationed himself for most of the war in Carnuntum, there are, we know from archeological finds that there are, like the largest concentration in the world of Mithraic shrines there. Right. And uh, one of the things that that's distinctive about them, they have these buildings that um, were, the ceiling and the walls were painted with astrological uh, signs and stars. Yeah. Like, so they're meant to resemble the night sky. And there are these passages in Marcus Aurelius where he says, imagine yourself among the stars. Like kind of when he's talking about things related to the view from above. Yeah. So it, it really it's easy to imagine that those passages are inspired by, you know, being in the yeah. those Mithraic uh, temples. Um, and the, the the practice of the view from above of kind of detaching and seeing things from uh, as if from space or from a great height. Why is that therapeutic for people? I think for a number of reasons. Um, one is that we know when people experiencing when people experience strong emotions like recently there's been a lot of interest in the fact that in the way it affects their allocation of attention mm -hmm. so when people are are distressed particularly when they're anxious um they tend to narrow the scope of attention and focus more on on perceived threats and we know that when people broaden their scope of attention when they're thinking about taking in several things at once uh, that it kind of dilutes their feelings. So you're, they're exposing mm. themselves to more stimuli at once. Like, whereas a, when you narrow your attention down, you're ignoring everything else and just focusing on the scary thing, like you're ma putting it under a magnifying glass, as it were. Mm. So the view from above massively expands our, our perception. So we, we, we can still think about a bad thing that's happened, but we're taking in a bunch of other things at the same time, which has mm. a kind of diluting effect, as well as placing things in a broader context. So people also tend to freeze images in time at the worst point. So they think about something bad that will happen, but they tend not to think about how they would recover from it in the days and weeks that follow. And right. when they broaden their temporal perspective as well, it usually dilutes the, the feelings of distress that they experience. Which is something Marcus does a lot, isn't he? Yeah. He talks about like the river of time, um, imagining all, I mean, a, a lot of kind of mortality meditations, no? Yeah, yeah. And t tell me a bit about some of them and why they're helpful, like the, as Marcus practices. Oh. <laughs> the phone. Um, yeah, I mean, the Stoics and, and other philosophical schools in the ancient world were into this idea of contemplating our own mortality. Mm. And, you know, Marcus believed that it has a number of benefits. And one of them is that, you know, if we remind ourselves that we're all going to die one day, that death is certain, then he believed that it prevents us from becoming too puffed up, from placing too much importance on certain things in life. You know, it allows us to kind of keep things in perspective more. And it also encourages us to, to be more grateful for the present moment like, yeah. and to, to experience a, a, a greater appreciation of, of life and in particular of the here and now. Mm. Now, Marcus um, would have, uh, and, and other Stoics, would they have believed in an afterlife? No, the Stoics generally didn't believe in an afterlife, and that's partly because they were they were kind of quasi materialists. Right. So they they rejected the Platonic idea of a kind of metaphysical heaven of pure forms or or any kind of like you know world behind the scenes as Nietzsche Nietzsche calls it. Like they right. thought that God 
Um, so although they believed in God, they, they were pantheists. So they believed that uh, God right. was imminent in the universe and he was really the, the mind of the, the cosmos as a whole. So okay. there, isn't anywhere, there isn't anywhere else to go, as it were. Like, there's not another... Right. Uh, another so the, bit of the, the bit of the Logos that's within you will go back to the big Logos. But yeah. But personality won't survive. That's what they tend to say, is that when we die, we return to nature. Right. Um, but there's not, but, and although some Stoics may have disagreed about this, I mean, Stoicism lasted 500 years, and we know that they did disagree about some theological points. So mm. I think there's some indication that some of them might believe that, that souls endured for a while after death, but generally they don't seem to have put much right. credence in the idea of an afterlife. Okay, so um, just finally, Don, um, what, how would you say that um, Stoicism has changed you in the kind of 15, 20 years that you've been engaged with it. Uh, and how, do you, how would you say that your stoicism has changed over that time? Well, gosh, I mean, my, I think my appreciation of stoicism has changed a lot over that period of time. And I guess um, in, in lots of ways, many kind of nuanced ways, you know, I more recently, like I mentioned earlier, I suppose I've you know, I've become more interested in what Stoicism says about friendship and relationships and love and stuff like that. You know, the kind of interpersonal aspect of Stoicism has become more important to me. And mm. also I see the Stoics more now as, as very much Socratics. And, you know, I, I see far more overlap between the philosophy of Socrates and, and Stoicism than I did before. And so that adds a kind of another dimension to my my appreciation of them mm. and again i see this what does that mean that you're enjoying the kind of platonic dialogues and so forth yeah and xenophon I'm, I'm kind of perhaps even more interested in the memorabilia uh of xenophon and his other dialogues as well and right. the other bits and pieces we know a lot about the socrates from other sources like diogenes laertius as well yeah. so yeah that kind of because the thing about plato is it was understood even in the ancient world that Plato's writings kind of evolved over time and that the earlier Platonic dialogues seem to be more representative of a, a simpler philosophy that, that right. was probably professed by Socrates. And then the middle and the later dialogues have the theory of forms and perhaps also political theories that right. seem unlikely to have come from Socrates. Right, sure. And are perhaps yeah. influenced by Pythagoreanism, like in his yeah, yeah. own perspective. So you're so the into... earlier. So you're into the kind of Socratic uh, and Xenophon um, and, and, and more of an interesting emphasis on like the relational and uh, I guess effect, effective with an A, uh, Stoicism yeah. in some ways. Yeah, yeah. And then the side And a, a more emotional Stoicism, like a positive yeah. emotions. You, 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 you yeah. Social, or, yeah, yeah, social emotions. Yeah, I mean, and in fact, the neglect of the interpersonal side of Stoicism it goes hand in hand with people kind of thinking that Stoics are unemotional, you know, yeah. because the, the most important emotional component of Stoicism is uh, natural affection, philostorgia, like uh, having a yeah. kind of compassion, like a kindness and affection towards other people, and, and in fact, yeah. trying to kind of extend that even to strangers and, yeah. you know. Do you think that the modern Stoic can can usefully draw on other wisdom traditions? And is that something you do? Yeah. Um, I mean, most of my time is spent studying Stoicism, so I don't, I don't have much time to kind of read other stuff now. But it, mm. I, when I was younger, I read very widely, you know. At university, I studied history of Indian religions as part of my mm -hmm. philosophy course. So I studied the Baghdad Gita in depth and uh, Tao Te Ching and, uh, you know, the Upanishads and, you know, lots of lots of kind of even a lot of new age and kind of occult literature and you know other aspects of Western philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things have influenced me over the years. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not so much engaged with them now, although I see people that are interested in Stoicism often drawing parallels with Buddhism, for example. Yeah, uh, and sometimes other like you know existentialism as well. Sometimes they'll connect it with or you know other other philosophical tra uh, spiritual traditions, definitely. And have you considered for your next project following up on your stories for Poppy uh, and doing a yeah. kind of uh, philosophical stories for children? I proposed that a while ago, but I don't. I can tell you what I'm doing next. Like uh, I'm 99% sure that uh -huh. very soon um, we're going to proceed with a, a graphic novel. 
that's mm -hmm. about Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism. So it's kind of similar to this book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, but it, it'll be a graphic novel. So huh. I've, I've done some, I've, I've done three web comics that are like little samples of that. Um, cool. we're, we're kind of pro almost certainly going to proceed with that next. And then after that, further down the line, this is more contentious, mm -hmm. right? but I, I'd like to write a book called The Female Socrates and that's about, about Hypatia or no? about uh, actually part well it's a like, it's a little bit complicated but <laughs> it's about it's about what Socrates says about love relationships and friendships so on and, and how that influenced uh, what the Stoics say but Socrates tends to attribute those aspects of his philosophy to several women including right. his mo his mother Phenarity yeah. who was a midwife to uh, Diotima. Uh, this who is priestess, a priestess in right. yeah. uh, who some people believe may we don't we know nothing else about her, but people think she sounds a lot like Aspasia, the courtesan uh, right. lover of Pericles, who Socrates allegedly was friends with and learned from, and yeah. and then there's a couple of other women that he there's a a, a courtesan called Theodota that uh, he has a dialogue with about love and friendship in, in the yeah. memorabilia. Um, so it seems like there's kind of a group, several women uh, that he, he talks about learning this stuff from. On the other one would be the Pythia, the uh, Oracle at Delphi, uh, also had a, a, yeah. an important influence on, on, on Socrates and kind of in a way yeah. started his, his philosophical career by, you know, by this pronouncement that no one was wiser than him. In Plato's yeah. Apology, he, he tells that story and he says this is really what started my right the, hit, the, the, the hidden women of greek philosophy yeah this these women that are in the kind of side life but socrates if you look closely at socrates he's he really attributes a lot of importance to the he does the yeah. that they had on him yeah yeah awesome well don it was a pleasure to catch up with you uh yeah, it was and nice good luck again. nice to speak to you and good luck with the book which comes out like you say first week of april or so Se second of april 2nd of April. Brilliant. Well, good luck with that. And thank you for all the work you do and all, all the stuff you do basically for free as well for the Stoic community. I'm sure it's appreciated by a lot of people. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for interviewing me, Jules. Right, it's nice to see you again. Nice to see you. And I hope to catch up with you in, in uh, offline as well, like maybe yeah. at the Stoic or whatever, but before yeah. too long, I hope. Yeah. Well, the next one's going to be in Athens. So maybe a, an opportunity. Is it? Uh, oh, cool. To, to yeah. Yeah.